last Sunday I uh, used, I told you all about the scriptures from Second Chronicles that said that Asa did, excuse me, Rehoboam did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. It talked about Asa, it talked about Jehoshaphat, it talked about Ezra, where they did the right thing because they did prepare their heart to seek the Lord. We need to not just take things for granted. If you do not prepare your heart to seek God, you might miss out. Asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking the door will be opened unto you. Here we find a scripture that says that um, if we will open ourselves up to the Lord, God will bless. But if we do not open ourselves up to the Lord, we can miss out. So a spirit-led life will never reject the Lord. A spirit-filled life will always um, bring you to a close relationship with the Lord. In the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter number, um, gosh, 12, it says this in verse number 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. If you're being led by the Holy Spirit of God, <clears throat> you're not going to be against the things of God. You're not going to be against the Word of God. You're not going to be against the ways of God. You're going to come and hear the Word of God this morning, and you're going to be open to it. Right? He says, also, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be active in our life, amplifying us, to the Father, through Jesus Christ the Son. We must have a relationship with Jesus to know life. And we must always, always, always be seeking the presence of the Spirit leading us to our Father and our Savior. We need to understand that, that what Jesus is trying to tell us here in Mark 4 is that there are ways to prepare your heart and there are things that happen to your heart that might keep you from knowing the Lord well. So I'm just going to kind of walk through this if you don't mind. I'm just going to kind of highlight some scripture here and I'm just going to walk through it and we're going to talk about it and, and then we're going to try to find some type of application to the word. Are you there? Because of time, I'm not going to ask you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. Let's just look in verse number 1 of chapter 4. Again, he began to teach by the sea. There is two different understandings. There is teaching and preaching, as, as, as Lance said. Teaching is giving you the truths. Preaching is to give you the application along with the truth. So he goes down by the seashore. The multitude, it says there a great multitude, was gathered to him. So he got into a boat. Now, there are two words that can be described as boat. One is the big ship. <coughs> they can't make it. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. One thing I found out from the MRIs is this has affected my vocal cords. I... Uh, Y'all think I'm such a loud mouth that I can just, I, and I pretty much am, but it is, there is an effect there. The first boat there is the big boat. It can't get all the way to shore. The other one is the rowboat where they would get from the big boat to the shore. This is more of a bigger boat, all right? Now, it's not huge. It's not an ocean liner. It's just a bigger fishing boat where they could keep all the fishermen in it and the haul of the fish in it. All right, so this is, this. Was, by the way, Mark most likely got most of what he knew about all of these early days through Peter. So it could have possibly even been Peter's boat that Jesus got onto. But when he got on, to, on the boat, he could teach the, the multitude. How many of you know water is a, is a great microphone? If you're speaking across water, people can hear better. So he gets out and he sits in the boat and he begins to teach them there so that they can hear. It's kind of like a loudspeaker there. Look in verse 3. It says, listen. 
Y'all hear me say that when I preach? You know why I say that? Because you're not listening. Y'all drift. How, how, how quickly can we leave New Holland and go to Kroger or Dead Lobster or the Texas Dead Roadhouse, right? You know, we, we can go in all those different directions, and sometimes we just need to understand that we need to listen. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us here in verse 9, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So that's what I'm going to say to you this morning. For those of you who are ready to hear something, God wants to speak. So let's listen. He says, behold, a sower went out to sow. He's going to tell us here of a story that would have been very understandable. All the people would have known it. There's a big field there. They didn't prepare the soil beforehand. The sower goes out and he reaches into his bag and he grabs a handful of seed and he sows the seed. He just sows the seed. He's casting the seed. Where it falls, it just falls. And there are four different types of soil that it may fall upon. The first one we find in verse number four. It happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, the roadside. You know, grass doesn't grow where people walk, right? It becomes packed down, and the seed cannot penetrate into it. And the seed is not going to grow until it can find soft soil that it can penetrate into. So it says here that, that the seed fell by the roadside, by the wayside, and the birds of the air came, and here's the word, devoured it. The word devour is a word for adversary. Satan himself comes. And he takes the seed away. Birds should come down and say, there it is. It's not in the heart. I'll take it away. And it will never be useful again. The second one is in verse 5. Some fell on the stony ground where he did not have much earth. It was shallow. It was full of rocks. And it says, and immediately, because there was some soil there, it sprang up. It was good soil for germination, the soil was warm, warm because the, the heat could take it there. And it, it, you know how when you get in the dirt and you dig down deep, the, the soil is kind of cool. But, but if the soil is warm, that's why people put them under a lamp sometimes if they're doing those things inside in the initial germination process. If the soil is warm, it will sprout immediately. But it needs depth. And because there is no depth there, what happens? When the sun comes down upon it, it just simply scorches it. That's a terrible word, isn't it? Just to scorch it. It's good for only a moment, but it's short-lived. Then it says, there's another one here, verse number 7, some seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no crop. No crop. Now, when this sower went out and he cast it, he cast it wherever. It kind of reminds me of those people who, um, who uh, overseed their yard in the fall. We have great hopes, don't we? We buy that expensive seed and we got the little thing and we, we walk through the yard and we, we're sweating out there and we're just casting the seed and, and it's just going everywhere. And we, we expect in spring to have the most luscious yards like they show on those line commercials. Amen? I mean, that's why. And we even pay extra for the kind that will kill the weeds. By the way, most of the time, they just kill whatever they touch. Y'all good with that too? Now, here is the thing. When that sower sowed the seed, he expected about a 10% harvest. I call that a very low return on your time and effort and money. A 10%? He knew those weeds were there. Just like we know in the springtime, we can do all that to our yard, but when, when, when springtime comes, we'll see one patch over here. It will look good. But you know, weeds grow green too. And when the hot sun comes, it'll kill the good stuff, but those weeds can, they can stand the test of time. 
when they come up strong among the others, there's a fight for the nutrients and it chokes them out. Then there's the fourth soil, verse number eight. Other seed fell on the good ground, yielded a crop that sprang up and increased and produced some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. And we all said, Amen. Y'all like that? It's good. Well, it says in verse 10, when he was alone with the disciples, those around him, the 12, asked him about the parable. And they said, he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. And to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. This is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And you're saying, I don't understand that. Why is it only for some of them? Why is it not for all of them? Well, take your Bible, flip over, if you would, into the book of 1 Corinthians again, into chapter number 2. I think this is a great scripture. I think it's wonderful. Uh, let's look in verse number 9. Are y'all listening? Y'all thinking about dead lobster? Okay. Yeah, man. Amen. Ken says, I got one to sleep back there. Praise God. It says, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Why? That we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, that's the key, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. What I'm going to share with you today, I pray, is the teachings of the Word of God. I also pray that we are ready and prepared to hear, so that when the Word of God finds the heart that's prepared by the power of the Spirit of God, He will generate and germinate life within us. It's not going to be by the talent of the speaker. It's not going to be by the skill of the way that we prepare. It's going to be simply the power of the Word of God, meshing with the Spirit of God, that finds a heart that is prepared where God can do the work that He wants to do, that only He can do. Look what it says in verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Y'all know a lot of people that in this world that call the things of God foolishness? Nor can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is righteously judged, judged by no one. Now, verse 16 is clear, and I'm going to get back to where we were in Mark 4. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You want to hear the mind of Christ? Let's talk about this parable that we walked through in 10 minutes. Let's walk through it again. And I pray that we are ready to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Now, Pastor, what do you mean by that? If in the next few moments you hear something that is an application, you hear something that is a prick, you hear something that is a word for you, Pastor, how will I know? You'll be thinking it. And there's a little extra mustard that comes with those thoughts. There, there's a little extra nudge that comes with it. So when you hear these, 
You may even see yourself in these. But you'll see it because the Holy Spirit is highlighting it within your spirit. His spirit to your spirit. Mark chapter 4. He explains it to them in verse 13. He says, do you not understand this parable? How then can you understand all the parables? He said, the sower sows the word, the words of God. He said, these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. He says very plainly, he said, when the, they go to sow the seed, he says, some hear the word. Or excuse me. He said, uh, these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes immediately. Now, listen. He comes disguised. If you actually saw Satan, you'd run as fast as you could in the opposite direction. He's cunning. When he came to Eve in the garden, he was seen, listen now, as a friend. One that they could carry on a conversation with. Be careful. Satan may come, and you may be comfortable with the words that come from him. But when Satan speaks, he speaks lies. He speaks destruction. His goal is to separate you from the Spirit of God because he knows the power of the Godhead. So he says Satan comes immediately and, and because it, it is exposed, because it, it fell on the top and the soil was not ready and it couldn't penetrate into the soil, it was vulnerable. And he takes it away. We could say that this soil was trampled down. We could say it was trampled down by life. We could say there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of events that happened. There's a lot of worries. There's a lot of brokenness. I don't know how many people we have here today, but all of us have faced it. All of us have, all of us have been affected. Sometimes even as children, things were said. Our parents did things. Maybe they meant to. Maybe they didn't mean to. Hearts were broken. Scars were made and maybe a person felt like the only one that they had to defend themselves was themselves and they put they put things around their heart to protect themselves that would sound natural wouldn't it if somebody walked up to you and just poked you in the eye i mean you you, you wouldn't like that it would be hard and hurt. But if you saw them walking up to you again, some of you would be like three stooges. But some of you would just say, no, 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 no. But some of you would just be unaware. Come on. Unaware of things that have happened and how they have affected you and hardened you. And Satan can come and steal your joy. Steal your life. Steal your, steal your purpose. Steal your peace. That is one of the saddest words that I know. It keeps so many people from knowing Christ. But I want you to hear this. In the next few moments as we talk about all of these, I preach this, I cannot tell you how many times I've preached this scripture. Most of the time when I was over 10,000 messages ago. I would just say that this is between a person and how they get saved. But you know what I found? This acceptance of the soul in your heart will keep you from being saved. But there's also Christians who follow the same example. There are Christians with hardened hearts that the Word of God can't penetrate anymore. That's tough. I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm. I'm grateful that I. I'm not the judge of the fruit. Right. Uh, when, when we get to heaven, only the God will say, "You're in. You're out. You're in. 
I knew you, I knew you, I knew you. I never knew you depart from me. It would be just him. But just trust me and understand that God's grace can, can still find a person, but yet they not grow to be fully who God wanted them to be. And they become hardened. You know, what is scary to this is when I find these people, they are the most defensive. They are the most defensive because they do not want to be hurt again and they'll do anything that they can. They don't even want to talk about the things of God. Or they have no appetite. If they're a Christian, they have no appetite for the things of God. Look at the second one. The second one, these are the ones sown on stony ground in the rocks. They have no depth. When they hear the word, immediately they know it is of God, and immediately they receive it. This is good, but there's no depth. There's no discipleship if they're a Christian. They just want to add on to their life. This is scary. So superficial. They have programmed into their life only so much room or time for God. But church, listen. Jesus wants to be Lord of all. He doesn't want part of your life. He wants all of your life. He can take your life with your loves, your hobbies, your ha- all those things can be sanctified unto Him. But if you live them for yourself, there's no depth. That seed that comes and, and produces life will be snuffed out. The Holy Spirit puts no limits on lordship. Either he's Lord of all or what? He's not Lord at all. It makes me worry about those who want Jesus to be Savior but not Lord. It makes me cringe. The shallow. The third is the the one that fell among thorns. Hold on, I didn't read verse 17. Let me talk one more time. Because they have no root in them, that group that we just talked about, They endure only for a time, but after that tribulation or persecution, or we could say hardships, any things that are the afflictions of life, they will arise for the word's sake, and immediately they stumble. They're here, and they're gone. A difficulty comes, and they get mad at God. Things don't go their way. I'm going to offend somebody, but I'm not trying to. They pout. They take their toys and want to go home. It's scary, those people. Then there are those that are among the thorns. Verse 18, these are the ones sown among the thorns, and they are the ones who hear the word. But the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things enter in and choke the word. They get crowded out of their life. They hear the word, but the world gets in the way. Distractions, money, things, the riches of this life, the desires of this life, their pride, their ego, they're building their own kingdom. These are the ones that we never see. They get choked out because they don't have time. They don't have time. These are the ones who don't pray very often. These are the ones who only open their Bibles on Sundays. These are the ones that the world has so many things to offer and they go to all these things. I I see this especially today among parents. The children of a lot of us baby boomers. The grandchildren of some of our baby boomers. And they want their kids to have, and they want their kids to have. 
but they don't give them the things of God. They don't teach them the things of God. They don't come to the church and let the church grow them in the ways of God because they don't want their kids to miss out. And they're teaching their kids that all of these other things are on the same importance of God. And we only have so much time. Listen to me. If you don't have enough time for God, you're not using your time for His glory and for your benefit. Y'all ever watch TV? They have commercials. And, and, and they can do more in a little few minutes. They will pay millions and millions and millions of dollars for 30 seconds. How much more could God do if we invested in Him? We're so interested in getting back to the show, right? What if we actually carved out and discipled ourselves into the ways of God? So we've got some that are hard. We, we've got some that just have no discipleship in their life. They have no depth in their life. It's there and then it's gone. We have those that are just crowded into their life. There's so many things. The people of God are the busiest they've ever been, but we're the least effective we've ever been. Oh, but there's the fourth soul. No rocks. It's got depth. We, we've gotten rid of those weeds. We've gotten rid of the distractions. Now, God is looking for a life that will get the other stuff out of the way so he has room to move, room to grow. And you know what? It's not 10% like the people in that day. No, it's 30%, 60%, or 100%. It just depends on how available we make ourselves to the Spirit of the living God. Oh, when I grew up, the preachers, man, they could preach some hell, fire, and brimstone. They were, they were going to scare you out of hell. But you know what I found in that day? Man, they, they held people accountable. My brother who's in heaven today, I, I, I walked into his church one time, and, 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 on, and on the walls it had, it had a scripture on the walls, and it had people's names. And their church had made up their mind that they were going to read the Bible together. So when you walked in, you had what you had done on the walls for all to see. But the thing about it was, some took it to heart. And they were just, they weren't embarrassed, they were thrilled. By the way, I think I'd be, boy, y'all would be mad at me in a heartbeat if I did something like that. You might feel exposed. I heard something a week or two ago. They said preachers, some preachers, it was in a survey, said that some preachers spend more, they do more praying publicly than they do privately. And I thought, Lord, help us. I, when y'all were honoring us, you talked about the sacrifices that we make. You're not going to see those. You're not going to know those, are they? The times we spend in prayer. The times we, I woke up at 3.30 this morning. I'm not going to be able to go home until after 8 o'clock tonight. My day is just pitched from one thing to the next all day. Y'all don't care about that. You don't see those things. I do those things under the Lord. I don't do those things for human consumption. I'm just saying all of us have things that we could do. All of us are there. It's just depending on what we're going to allow into our life. All of us are going to go through hardships. Nobody's excluded. Oh, but all of us can have a hundredfold. I'm living my life now. But the produce of my life I'll find in heaven. I am planting for this. I've been planting for 36 years in the ministry. We've been sowing as it comes, right? 
and I'm planning for a new harvest. And church, my goal, my goal as your pastor is that the harvest will outlive me. Everything that we do, we're building not for today. There will be fruit for today, but we're building for something else. As a matter of fact, I'm building for the next generation. It is my heart's desire that New Holland Baptist Church will be stronger in five years and in 10 years and in 20 years than it is today. And I'm willing to do everything I know to do, can do, I'm willing to do, learn to do, so that we can hold on to one generation and reach out to another lost generation and do a whole lot of discipleship in between. If we can't leave it better, then we need to do nothing. Doctors say, what? Do no harm? Well, the only way we're going to do harm is by not even trying. But we should do all that we can. Cheyenne, when you came to church here, you brought a smile. A lot of people don't know Cheyenne used to bring Josiah here every morning, and she'd go in the prayer room, and she'd get on her knees, not for everybody else to see, not for everybody else to know, but she'd get down there on that prayer altar, and she would pray for me. She would pray for this church. She would pray for y'all. And little Josiah with that curly hair, my goodness, that boy's got some curly hair. Beautiful kid. He was in there learning without even knowing. Y'all hear me? I want those prayers to join with your prayers, and they have, re they have action now, but they have action going forward. They get answered over and over and over and over. Brother Jim, I don't know how many years you've been a deacon here and, and served in this church and all that. I, I, I love you. I appreciate you. He brings me water up here because he doesn't want to see his preacher, the loud mouth, be a dry mouth. Amen. Praise God. And I'll drink to you. But the deal is, is he's still reaping the prayers that he prayed 60 years ago. That's a good crop. Church, these are the words of Jesus. Let them fall where they may. But we need an abump we need a bumper crop. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above. Now I know that some people have never received Christ. That's scary. That's scary. But we need to begin to prepare our hearts. What would happen if God, if we knew that God wanted to do something amazing? 30 seconds, listen. What would we do if God wanted to do something amazing? Would you want to be a part? What are you willing to do? Follow him. Follow him. Listen to that still small voice and say yes. That's enough. How many of us are qualified to do that? The ones that believe. And you'll find that you'll be discipled faster than you ever knew. Quit saying no. But when the Holy Spirit speaks, Say yes. It's been 33 minutes. I know it seemed like an hour and a half. The next two minutes are vitally important. What are you going to do with what God has said?